My name is Patrick Iber, and I'm there. We go. My name is Patrick Iber, and I am currently serving as the associate chair of the history department. I'm here on behalf of our chair, Ann Hansen, who's away from campus this week. Uh, and though a poor substitute for our fearless leader I may be, I am very happy that this is one of the tasks that has fallen to me because I would be here anyway. Uh, it is my job to introduce the person who will introduce our speaker tonight, which, which tells you that this is an important event because that's the rule. The more people that introduce the people that introduce the speaker, the more important the event is. Someday I'd like to be part of a chain where there are three introductions, but here we have two. Um, given that, I will be brief. Uh, this is the second annual lecture named in honor of Doria D. Johnson. When we were working to recruit Professor Simon Balto to join our faculty, this public spirited event was one of his requests. And that already tells you something about the character of Dr. Balto and his concerns, not just for himself, but, our for, but for our communities, both academic and not. Uh, Simon is the College of Letters and Science Mary Herman Rubinstein Professor of History now and the author of Occupied Territory, Policing Black Chicago from Red Summer to Black Power, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2019. It won the Benjamin Hooks Institute National Book Award as well as, as that of the Union League Club of Chicago. And he is hard at work on not one, not two, but three separate projects. Uh, a History of White Mob Violence from Reconstruction to the Civil Rights Era, a biography of Fred Hampton and a book called Racial Framing about the practice of white criminals donning blackface to commit crimes in US history. He's also co-editing a volume revisiting the black metropolis, new histories of black Chicago. And he writes regularly for newspapers and magazines. He's a regular contributor to the Guardian, for example. Having this wonderful scholar as part of our campus and being able to support events like this takes a village as the saying goes. And our, an important part of our community is our board of visitors. These friends of the department make crucial contributions to us to support programming like this event today. And the Doria D. Johnson lectures were made possible by the particular support of Dean Pagatis as well as Bill Lucy. So we thank them as well as the rest of the board for their generosity and hope that we are giving back in our own way by hosting this kind of event today. I know that our board and our community believes that confronting difficult truths about our past is part of building a better future. And that work is, on either end, not easy. But we are grateful to be able to do it. And I would like to extend a word of solidarity to our colleagues in Florida who are finding it more and more difficult to do that. And with that, uh, turn things over to Simon so that he can introduce our speaker, who you are still allowed to learn from, in Wisconsin. Thank you, Patrick. Um, thank you all for coming out. Um, thank you all for those tuning in from afar. Um, I want to give a special shout out to everybody that made this happen, everybody at the Pile Center, um, especially to Brio Remus, um, who did a lot of tireless work behind the scenes uh, to, to pull this off. Um, so this lecture series is named for Doria D. Johnson, who some of you knew, and uh, some of whom did not have the extraordinary privilege of getting to meet. Um, Doria was a friend of many of ours um, in, the, uh, in this larger community. Uh, she earned her master's degree in FM here at UW in 2009, and she was a PhD candidate in history here um, until her untimely death in 2018. Um, Doria's life and work sat very much at the crux of historical research and social justice activism. Um, she was the great, great granddaughter of Anthony Crawford, who was a black man lynched in Abbeville, South Carolina in 1916 for refusing to bend to the dictates of Jim Crow America. Doria was at the forefront of an ultimately successful movement from the late 1980s to the early 2000s that forced the United States Senate to finally, after nearly a century of indifference, to apologize for its long and inexcusable past refusals to enact anti-lynching legislation. Her work as a historian built 
off of that social justice labor. Her master's thesis at UW, which I did some brief rereading of uh, earlier today, explored the chain migration of families like her own who were driven out of the Southern United States by racist violence and towards places in the North. Her dissertation research examined the working and social lives of black women in Evanston, Illinois, where her family settled after being driven out of Abbeville and where she was born and raised. Beyond Doria's work surrounding family history specifically and black history generally, she traveled over the course of her life to Cuba, to Israel, to Palestine, to South Africa, to Sri Lanka, among other places, as an advocate for human rights and as an advocate for a better world for all. And I count myself among the many people who feel fortunate to have learned from Doria, to have laughed with Doria, and to have loved Doria. And I think I speak for many of us in this room when I say that I, like many others, deeply miss Doria. At the risk of prolonging introductory comments, I think I would be remiss to not play a brief video of Doria. Um, it, is a, it is a video from the Equal Justice uh, Initiative with which Doria was working uh, late in her life. And it's a series of still images, but Doria narrates the video. And Doria had such a presence about her that I think for those of you who did not get to know her, I think we would all benefit from hearing a bit from her. So I'm going to do, play that very briefly, and then uh, we will proceed. I am the great, great granddaughter of Anthony Crawford, who was lynched October 21st, 1916. And my aunt's home was where we had our Thanksgiving dinners and Christmases. He owned the largest photograph of him in a permanent space over the dinner table. And they always pointed to him and said, walk with a sense of pride because Grandpa Crawford took up for his right to the crime of his death. As a child, when we were told the story of Grandpa Crawford, he's like a king almost. We were told that he was born enslaved and had worked his way up to owning property and was wealthy. He started a school for the Black children in Abbeville. He was the president of the Black Masons of South Carolina. And at the time of his death, Grandpa Crawford owned 427 acres of crime cobbling. So one day in 1916, it's a Saturday morning, Grandpa Crawford went to town to sell cotton seed and they offered him 85 cents per unit that was worth more. He said, give me my damn cotton seed back and was arrested for hurting the white man. Word had gotten around town that Anthony Crawford had started acting uppity. And so about 400 people gathered taking Grandpa out of the jail. They stabbed him, beat him, tied him to the back of the buggy and drove back around town to the county fairgrounds. They hung him there and riddled his body with 200 bullets. The last thing he said was, I thought I was a good citizen and give my benefit to my children. The family tried to retrieve the body and were told to leave it there. So, if you could imagine your grandfather being at home eating breakfast with the children, laughing, and then all of a sudden he's hanging from a tree with 200 bullets in him, that's a form of terrorism. And then there was an ad taken in the newspaper by white citizens. And they said that the Crawford family needed to leave the state of South Carolina, otherwise everybody's life was in danger. My great-great-uncle, Walter, Grandpa's oldest son, wrote Governor Richard R. Manning and asked him for protection. Governor Manning wrote back and said while he deplored the lynching, he could not guarantee our safety. 
So my family didn't leave the South. They were chased away from the South. We moved to Evanston, Illinois, and not only did the prophets leave, but half of the Black population of Evansville was gone within the next 10 years. I haven't spent a lot of time in the South. The first time I went to Arizona was the first time I could understand what 427 acres looked like. And that's when I think I got really offended. That's the day I became an actor. I came home and I started writing congressmen. And I'm saying, do you know that family was kicked off this property for this? These are unsolved murders. And people who benefited from lynching, their families are still alive. And they're still benefiting financial reward from the land of our ancestors. And that just seems a shame. So for Grandpa to Emmett to trade on, the trajectory of lynching history has shifted over time in America. Because when Grandpa was killed in 1916, there was no charges brought and no trial. In 1955, Emmett Till's murder, there was a trial but no conviction. And then Trayvon Martin, now you have a trial and a not guilty verdict. So all the time you have dead black bodies and nobody's ever convicted for the murders. On the 100th anniversary of Grandpa Parker's lynching, we went back to Ellieville. Over 200 family members came from all over the United States to help unveil the murder dedicated to Grandpa Parker's lynching. And I remember Grandpa's granddaughter, one of the only living grandchildren, was next to me in a wheelchair. And when we took the cover off with the monitor, she looked at the picture of him. I saw her face light up, and I heard her say, my, my, my. And to watch her enjoy that moment, that meant the world to me. So the marker being in Abbeville is important because the story has been denied for so long. But now, if you go to Abbeville City Hall to do this, you have to walk right past your city property to do it. You can't bypass them anymore. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. There is a, a beautiful symmetry in the fact that our guest this year for the second annual Doria D. Johnson lecture in history and social justice is someone who Doria loved to read. Um, I, um, my friend Eric, who I know is on the, uh, on the live stream. What's up, Eric? Um, he was, a, he was one of Doria's professors at Roosevelt University in Chicago. And um, he had mentioned to me that, uh, you know, that they used to read Robin Kelly's book or books. Um, and I asked him just to, to email me a couple of, of reflections that he had. And he said that his, his memories were a little bit um, fuzzy, but that he was absolutely certain in his clarity about in a class with Doria, reading Race Rebels, and specifically Doria being enamored with how Professor Kelly talks about writing working class history from way, way below, and about the ways in which she carried that forward into her thinking about writing about Black folks in Evanston. Robin D.G. Kelly probably needs no introduction. He asked me not to give one. <laughs> so without further ado, I turn it over to Professor Kelly. Okay, see, there's only one person in my life who's ever actually done that, that I say, don't give me an introduction. And that's actually my niece, Kayla, Kayla Caldwell. Um, she was an undergrad at, at Scripps, and um, they and the professor made her introduce me in front of like thousands of people. 
and well, 500 people. Um, and I said, just say, Google him. And it was perfect. So you win the prize. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so honored to be here for lots of different reasons. Thank you, Simon, for the invitation. Um, I should mention a couple of things. One is that uh, this talk is from um, a book I'm trying to finish in the next couple of months. And it just so happens that the only place I've ever presented on this book has been at University of Wisconsin. The last time when Jenna Lloyd invited me and I gave the um, lecture a couple, I guess, couple, last year, or a couple of years ago. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and so it's great to be here. I have some things to say about Doria, and I'm going to say that for a second. But for now, it's just so great to see so many people, so many friends, to see, you know, my niece, who's a brilliant scholar coming up in geography, to see, um, I'm not going to name everyone. But to see uh, Dr. Tulani Davis, who um, I have to say is such a Renaissance person that she makes Paul Robeson look like a neophyte. I have to say, like, like a slacker. Um, but, but Tulani is the model for being like the intellectual of the 20th and 21st century, because I don't know anyone who could do all the things that you do and do so well, you know? So it puts us all to shame, but in a way that makes me really proud to be your friend. Um, but most importantly, I want to honor uh, Doria D. Johnson and to remember a scholar activist who demanded that we remember, right? She was in her own words, an abolitionist, a maroon and a memory worker. And she really was my kind of comrade I mean, the fact that she went to Roosevelt, Roosevelt, I think, is one of the most important institutions in the world. If you think about the people who came out of Roosevelt, you know, Frank London Brown, John Bracey. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people. And I come from a working class institution. I come from Cal State Long Beach, which is very much like a Roosevelt. So, you know, I'm just surprised that we didn't, we had to have met at some point because she is a product of Chicago's Black radical tradition. If you don't know that, you should know that. Um, she worked, she lived in the world of the legendary Jacob Carruthers. If you don't know who he is, look him up. Um, and as she put it, she came up in the context of the murder of Fred Hampton. I'm so glad that you're writing this biography because I, you know, he's incredibly important. Uh, and her father came up in the context of the murder of Emmett Till. And she did something which I, I wanted to follow, and that is she, uh, 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 introduced the practice of naming our ancestors who died at the hands of white terrorism on the day that she presented. So on today, March 23rd, I'm going to name some names. Um, in St. Charles, Arkansas, there was a mass lynching, a massacre, which took four days, March 21st to 24th, 1904. And those killed were Abe Bailey, Mac Baldwin, Will Baldwin, Garrett Flood, Randall Flood, Aaron Hinton, Will Madison, Charlie Smith, Jim Smith, Perry Carter, Kellis Johnson, Henry Griffin, and Walker Griffin. Also in Arkansas, March 23rd, 1912, in Fort Smith, Sanford Lewis uh, was lynched, and there are others. And by the way, as I see the name Aaron Hinton, I just wanna say one last thing before I begin, and that is, you know, talk about full circle. I'm coming after uh, Liz Hinton, who gave the first story of D. Johnson lecture. And you got to understand, Liz is like family to me. She was my undergraduate student at NYU. I was like the fifth member of her committee when she was at Columbia working on the dissertation. But more than that, most people don't know, I met Liz when she was in junior high school because her professor, Al Hinton, was my then wife's professor at University of Michigan. And I remember going to the house and seeing this, you know, young, this girl who's really smart. And I'm like, she's going to get a PhD in history. Actually, I didn't say that. But, you know, so coming after Liz is so special and so important that I feel like it just connects me even more. Okay, so let me begin. As you see, it's, um, it's what is it, 528. Um, and we've had two introductions. We've had a video. Um, so when I when I talk, I'm going to skip over some things for time, but just remember that we started 
at 528. So don't think that was going on and on and on. Okay, just remember that. <clears throat> and let me just make sure this is working. Okay. So on Sunday afternoon, December 14th, 1969, Eleanor Williams, resident of an apartment building on West 117th Street, discovered the body of a young black male in a common bathroom. Next to him lay two glassine envelopes, a syringe, eyedropper, and a bottle cap. Now in Harlem in those days, dead, a dead junkie was hardly newsworthy, but this was not your run of the mill junkie. His name was Walter Vandermeer, a child barely 12 years old. Now uh, he had become heroin's youngest fatality. The local and national press jumped on the story, emphasizing his diminutive size, he's 4'11", weighed 80 pounds, his poverty, his alleged family dysfunctionality, uh, and his innocence. He was wearing a Snoopy sweatshirt with the inscription, I wish I could bite somebody. I need a release from my inner tensions. For the next two years, Walter Vandermeer was the subject of numerous articles and columns. His name appeared in clinical studies, in the congressional record, and in countless legislative hearings. But was he, as one salacious headline put it, drunk at 10, addict at 11, dead at 12? Uh, no. In fact, he was never an addict. The autopsy showed that Walter had been using heroin intermittently, possibly for three months. He had no track marks anywhere on his body. He was uh, skinning, or what's, what's called skin popping, shooting heroin under the skin, but not directly into a vein or main lining. And he displayed none of the common physical signs of heroin addiction, hypersensitivity to pain, dry mouth, cramps, nausea, insomnia. Moreover, there's evidence of foul play, which I don't have time to talk about. You can read about it in the book when it comes out. But for our purposes tonight, what matters is that he had become the poster child for a new war on drugs. His death sparked the moral panic and a national reckoning that positioned black urban youth as both the object and perpetrators of a new drug crisis. Now, I was two months shy of my eighth birthday when I learned of Walter's terrible fate. I lived with my mother, my nine-year-old sister, and my baby brother on 157th in Amsterdam, about 40 blocks from where he died. Now, a 12-year-old boy shooting up in those days wasn't really shocking. Uh, in fact, when we lived at 523 West 156th Street, one block over, in 1968, our building superintendent died of a heroin overdose. The building on the southeast corner uh, from us about a few, few doors down on 156th and Broadway, um, housed one of Harlem's biggest quote-unquote dope factories. After school, we frequently packed into a tiny storefront candy store on the corner of 157th in Amsterdam and bought fistfuls of caramel squares and pixie sticks for a penny. Only after the cops raided the place did we learn that its chief product was dope. Now, what shocked my friends and me wasn't Walter shooting up, but it was Walter's death. In some ways, he was the Emmett Till of my generation, of my Harlem. He wasn't brutally lynched or gunned down by cops, but similar to black kids who saw themselves in those terrifying photographs of Till's mutilated corpse, many of us saw ourselves in Walter. His story, or at least the version put out by the press, served as a cautionary tale about the consequences of drugs and predators. If we're not careful, we might be the next Walter Vandermeer. The message was drilled into us by adults, in classrooms, public service announcements, after-school television specials, and of course, police-sponsored events. But Emmett Till's lynching inspired resistance, not caution. Young Black civil rights workers understood that an entire system took the 13-year-old boy's life, a system, 14-year-old uh, boy's life, a system that allowed Till's killers to go free denied Black people a decent livelihood, the franchise, a fair trial, and forced many to flee the state just to exercise their basic rights. Now, although I was too young to understand at the time, uh, there were activists who similarly considered Walter a casualty of the system. The Black Panthers, the Young Lords, socialists and communists, radical cultural workers, street orators proclaimed dope is death and pushers the enemy of the people, while identifying the real killers as racism, poverty, the police, and above all, capitalism. 
They considered the flood of heroin a manifestation of US imperial and chemical warfare, which they tried to counter through political education and community-based detox programs. The state not only crushed the very organizations addressing addiction by non-chemical and non-carceral means, but it deployed a police department deeply involved in the drug trade. By 1969, the Narcotics Division of the NYPD was arguably the largest heroin dealer in the city outside of the Lucchese crime family. And that's a fact. Now, premature death, of course, was a common feature um, of Walter Vandermeer's world. And comparatively few died by the needle. Lurking beneath the sensational stories of adolescent drug addiction lies a deeper history of racial capitalism, administrative violence, and a complicit police state. The long story of Walter's premature death is embedded in a history of slavery, colonialism, American imperialism, intergenerational poverty, racism, urban divestment, deportation, policing, poor schools, and a carceral social services bureaucracy. National coverage of Walter's story provided the ammunition President Richard Nixon needed to launch his war on drugs and for the New York governor, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, to promote the most draconian anti-drug laws in the nation. Walter's death also strengthened the case for treatment in tandem with punishment. See if this works, okay. Now, Lily Price bore 11 children. Walter was her sixth in the second child she buried. As a mother of heroin's youngest victim, she faced a barrage of criticisms from state agencies and the press demeaning her as unfit and negligent. She descended from generations of black women who raised children against impossible odds and who were also deemed unfit. Born in Charleston, South Carolina in 1926, Lily was the youngest child of Will Morgan and Anna Gardner. Anna's father, Adam Gardner, born into slavery, had deep roots in Sumter County, but when he married Priscilla Boozer in 1889, they moved to her hometown of Lexington, South Carolina. They had barely settled in when on May 5th, 1890, a mob broke into the county jail and lynched 17-year-old Willie Leapart after he was falsely uh, convicted of raping a white girl. The lynching caused a small exodus of black families from Lexington, much like what happened uh, in Abbeville, but the gardeners chose to stay. Five months later, Priscilla gave birth to twins, Haskell and Hattie, followed by Samuel a year, a year later, and Anna in December, 1895. Now Anna fled Lexington for the city of Charleston, where she met and married Will Morgan in 1914. The second of nine children, Will grew up mainly in Abbeville County, where his parents were sharecroppers. Anna took in laundry and Will managed to find work at a phosphate mill but after their first child, Anna was born in December, 1915, the mill closed down and Will took a job repairing railroad tracks. Still short of income, he enlisted in the army in the summer of 1918. Now, Will never saw combat in Europe. In fact, he never left the state of South Carolina, but war came uh, to the 10th Ward less than six months after his discharge. On May 10th, 1919, a fight between a group of white sailors and black men standing outside a black pool, black owned pool hall escalated to a pogrom. Dozens of sailors stole guns and ammunition from a nearby shooting gallery and laid waste to black homes and businesses. Black residents of course shot back. Charleston's mayor called the Marines to restore order but only after three black men had been killed and at least 18 seriously wounded. Okay, just make sure I got the right slide. <laughs> Uh, Will may have been among the armed men determined to protect his family, his three-year-old daughter, and his wife, who at the time was six months pregnant. Um, the thought of returning home to Abbeville County, however, may have crossed his mind, but the lynching of Anthony Crawford, who we've heard about, three years earlier made Abbeville a less than desirable location. War was everywhere. The births of George in 1919 and Lily that is to say, um, Walter's mother, in 1926, were rare, bright moments for, for the Morgans amid terribly dark times. In the course of six years, Anna lost an infant son, her grandfather, her father, and her eldest daughter, Anna, 
who died of acute renal failure, most likely caused by an undiagnosed urinary tract infection. She was just shy of 12 years old. The marriage, of, the marriage unraveled. Will Morgan uh, moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, leaving Anna to raise two children by herself. Uh, and she survived on public belief and meager wages from domestic work uh, during what was the, then the greatest economic downturn in modern history. Her son, George, was forced to leave school in the seventh grade to become the primary breadwinner. And Lily dropped out of school in the fourth grade to help her mother clean houses. Like her mother, who fled Lexington for the city, Lily was determined to leave Charleston. In 1947, she and a young man named Cyril Price hastily married and joined the exodus of Black people heading north. They chose New York City. With no money, no family ties, and few prospects for work, the couple settled in Harlem. On March 26, 1949, Lily gave birth to twins, Eugene and Regina. As she struggled to care for two newborns in cramped quarters, Cyril grew increasingly scarce. When their daughter Beverly was born 11 months later, Cyril was gone. Lily had moved on to a new relationship resulting in the birth of a son, Reginald Brooks, in January 1951, but his father had no desire to start a family. She survived thanks to the New York welfare system and the kindness of Black women. Lucille Odoms. Barbara Banks, Carlitha Morrison, Catherine and Sarah Stewart, these were all neighbors and friends who helped care for Lily's children and made sure they had food, clothes, and a roof over their head. They were not blood relatives, but they were kin. They created the kind of network of support that sustained Black families in slavery and freedom, the social safety net that the social scientists, social workers, and the press were unable or unwilling to see. Willie Vandermeer turned heads. His smooth, light brown complexion, curly dark hair, deep set piercing eyes, and easy smile caught Lily's attention. The attraction was mutual. He was only 26 when they met in 1952, and he was even younger, barely 22 years old. Son of Jacques and Paulina, Paulina Vandermeer, Willie was born and raised in Suriname's capital, Paramaribo. The Vandermeers were Creoles, descendants of enslaved Africans. Theirs was a world of poverty and precarity in a land that enriched European landowners and foreign capitalists. Sugar, cacao, coffee, bananas, and sap from balada trees used to make latex were among the principal exports, but none more important than bauxite. Alcoa, Aluminum Company of, of America, held a monopoly over the colony's bauxite mines and ran its only aluminum plant. And as a consequence, Suriname became a major shipping entrepôt for US trade. During the Great Depression, the colonial government not only imposed austerity measures, but provided no public relief, leaving many families on the verge of starvation. Communists and pro-independence groups organized mass protests for political and economic reforms, and the colonial authority responded with repression. Wartime demand for bauxite improved the economy, but did nothing to mitigate, col mitigate uh, colonial violence. The Nazi invasion of the Netherlands prompted the colonial governor to declare martial law, which he invoked to imprison not only Germans, but anti-colonial activists. Rudy Vandermeer, Willie's older brother by 10 years, watched political and economic conditions deteriorate. He wanted to see the world, make a decent living. So at the age of 20, he went to sea working as a servant on passenger and freight uh, ships, traveling between the Caribbean and US ports of call. In 1948, when Willie turned 18, Rudy got him a job on a ship traveling between Curacao, Haiti, and New York City. And somewhere along the way, Rudy contracted a kidney infection and he had to be hospitalized in New York. Now, by the time he recovered, the ship had departed, leaving the two brothers stranded. So they didn't exactly jump ship, but in a few days, that just a few days in New York, it was enough to convince them to stay. Now, Willie was serious about um, Lily. They spoke of marriage. When she became pregnant, he didn't flee like the others. And they were very much in love when she gave birth to their son, Anthony Vandermeer, on August 29th, 1954. He doted on Tony. and was initially a steady presence in his life, 
but he struggled financially. Lily continued to rely on welfare and Willie's immigration status limited his employment opportunities. Besides, undocumented Caribbean uh, migrants had come under increasing scrutiny from the INS. And that's something we could talk about. They stayed together long enough to have uh, Walter born on December 1st, 1957. Unlike Tony, Walter never got the chance to know his father. In early May, 1958, INS agents arrested Willie as he was leaving his job at a Midtown drugstore. He was convicted and promptly deported back to Suriname, never to return. Now, how much time Willie spent with Walter during those crucial months is hard to say. At the time of his arrest, Lily had moved on to a new relationship and was already pregnant. Her new man, Sunday Togba, uh, was a recent immigrant who had left Liberia for New York in 1953. Lily and Sunday welcomed their first child, Do Togba, on December 29, 1958, followed by a daughter, Lorraine, a year later. And Sunday was a good father, was committed. Um, Lily's circle of female friends continued to help out with childcare, food, and money, but she was overwhelmed. As 1960 drew to a close, she had eight children, ranging from 11 to a newborn, and still lived in cramped quarters at 305 West 117th Street. Then tragedy struck. On March 5th, 1962, she gave birth to a second set of twins, Gilbert and Gregory. Three months later, Gilbert died. The law sent her into a downward spiral, further exacerbated when she learned that her 12-year-old daughter, Regina, was pregnant. Regina was pushed out of school and into a prison-like training program for unwed mothers, and Lily never recovered, uh, fully recovered emotionally. Yeah. The odds that Walter Vandermeer would live to adulthood were never great. Black kids died all the time in New York City. Walter was six when a cop killed 15-year-old James Powell on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, sparking anti-police riots in Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant. A couple of months earlier, patrolmen severely beat uh, some children who had overturned a Harlem fruit stand and kind of mischievously uh, began pelting each other with loose apples and oranges. Two young black men, Daniel Ham and Wallace Baker, intervened to protect the kids, but were themselves brutally, brut brutally beaten and arrested. When they charged the police, with police, when they charged the police with brutality, the cops framed them, along with four black youth, with the murder of a white couple, despite the absence of evidence. In a poignant essay, defending what came to be known as the Harlem Six, James Baldwin observed. The police are simply the hired enemies of this population. They are present to keep the Negro in his place and to protect white business interests, and they have no other function. Now, no one understood this point that uh, Baldwin made better than the drug dealers who lived on Walter's block and the residents who wanted them out. West 117th Street was well known uh, for drug dealers, a whole corridor was like a place to go buy drugs. Some black community leaders called on police to be more aggressive and even lobbied for longer sentences uh, for drug dealers. But their efforts were in vain for one simple reason. The police were complicit in the trade. Officers working for both the Federal Narcotics Bureau and the NYPD, particularly the Narcotics Division, held on to the contraband and cash they seized using drugs as currency to pay informants, to plant on suspects, this is called flaking, to supplement an arrestee's stash in order to increase the charge, this is called padding. Um, cops stored drugs and paraphernalia in their lockers, took bribes from dealers, financed heroin transactions, introduced potential customers to dealers, kidnapped witnesses to prevent them from testifying, provided armed protection for narcotics dealers, Offered, hire, offered to hire hitmen to kill potential witnesses, and in some cases, outright sold drugs back to dealers. During the 60s and early 70s, cops assigned to the Special Investigations Unit of Narcotics, uh, the Narcotics Division, stole approximately $32 million worth of heroin 
from the evidence room, sold it on the streets, and divided the profits among themselves. And who's talking about ab abolish the police, right? Just think about that. In 1963, Walter started kindergarten at PS76 on West 121st Street and 7th Avenue. And he was curious, uh, he was intelligent, he was a very restless kid whose teachers just never understood his energy. By second grade, he was constantly being reprimanded for being disruptive, which his teachers handled by physically restraining him or putting him out of the classroom. And by the way, in, in my book, I talk about my own experiences uh, in first grade under Miss Lavatan, who was equally violent and brutal, um, you know, who'd make kids, you know, stand in the garbage can and say, I'm garbage, you know, um, as punishment in front of everybody, you know, and I have horror stories about that. Um, teachers at PS76 identified his brother, Tony, who was in the fourth grade, as the bright kid, and still Tony got pushed out of school. In sixth grade, uh, Tony started skipping school because he was embarrassed by his raggedy clothes and he had holes in his shoes. In 1966, a family court judge sent Tony to the notorious Spofford Junior Juvenile Detention Center in the Bronx before being transferred to a shelter in Queens run by the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. The court allowed the transfer simply because he was classified as a ne neglected child. Meanwhile, on March 2nd, 1967, nine-year-old Walter was suspended from school for disruptive behavior, falling asleep in class and fighting with other children. Two weeks later, family court assigned uh, Walter to the same children's center that, um, ch children's shelter in Queens that uh, Tony was at, not uh, for his classroom behavior, but similar to his brother on the basis of a neglect petition. So their reunion was short-lived. Tony was sent to a group home in Upper Manhattan run by two black women and then transferred to a group home in Yonkers, both run by Leak and Watt Services. There, Tony found a supportive and safe environment with an abundance of resources, progressive leadership and opportunities to play sports. And he went to Yonkers High School. As soon as he arrived in Yonkers, Tony then tried to have Walter transferred there. So he wrote letters to judges, counselors, truant officers, school administrators, and pressed his social worker, uh, but all of his appeals fell on deaf ears. So whereas Tony thrived under the supervision of New York's Child Protective Services, Walter was crushed. Tony was the rare exception, Walter was the rule. Following Walter's suspension from third grade, Third grade, PS76 never followed up with a psychological evaluation or a consultation between Lily, uh, a psychologist, or the Bureau of Child Guidance. Neither Lily nor Walter was present when a judge ruled that he be placed in his mother's custody and attend PS148, which was, quote, a special school for disturbed and socially maladjusted children. No school official or social worker followed up with a home visit. In short, Walter was back home, but with no instructions as to what to do or where to go. In April 8, 1968, family court once again uh, deemed Lily unfit and decided to place Walter in the Whitlick, um, Wiltlick, Wiltwick, sorry, school for boys, Wiltwick School for Boys, which was a treatment center for, quote, disturbed youths from the slums and it was located um, in Yorktown Heights, Westchester County. Now, since the Yorktown campus was already at capacity and struggling financially, Walter was placed uh, temporarily in uh, the uh, Floyd Patterson house, which is a halfway house kind of downtown uh, New York uh, on the uh, 18th street on the east side. And this was a house designed specifically for Wiltwick students and um, the problem was that for Walter, who was too young for the program, it was a very bad fit. Um, the kind of programs they offered uh, were just not appropriate. So he responded as any 10-year-old would respond if he'd been kicked out of school, taken from his family, and shuttled between shelters in the streets. He just threw tantrums. 
I mean, he's 10 years old. The lead psychiatrist put him in restraints and sedated him with 50 milligrams of Thorazine four times a day. He bonded with one of the counselors, a recent college graduate named John Schoenbeck, who's you know, shared Dutch names became a point of, of connection. Now in June of 68, a spot finally opened up at Wiltwick's uh, Yorktown campus. Schoenbeck, you know, drove Walter up there uh, to Yorktown, but never told him that he was leaving him there. As soon as he realized that this would be his new residence, he rebelled. He felt betrayed, abandoned, and terrified being so far from home. And to make matters worse, he arrived days after 15 World Wick staff members had been suspended for protesting the school's woefully inadequate clothing allowances, poor food, and their resistance to teaching Black history, um, and incidents of what was identified as brutality towards students. They charged the administration with racism and running the school like a penal colony. Activists and educators in Harlem backed the protests and demanded an investigation. So this is where they dropped Walter off. So for Walter, uh, Wiltwick was a penal colony. It felt like that. He ran away at least four times, telling his mother that he'd been beaten. Finally, on October 10th, 1968, the administration conceded that he was unmanageable and sent his case back to family court. The judge gave Lily and Walter three options. He could either return to PS 148, which he actually never started. He could receive psychiatric counseling at Harlem Hospital or join one of the self-help teams administered by Harlem Youth Opportunities Unlimited and Associated Community Teams. That is how you, how you act. Now, placing him in the Yonkers group home with Tony was never presented as an option. Again, keep in mind, Tony's writing all these, all these letters, trying to get his brother in the same place with him. Now, his sister Regina convinced their mother, Lily, to nix the last two options because of her own traumatic experiences in a training school for pregnant girls. From her vantage point, these state institutions were no less dangerous than the streets. So his only choice was to return to PS 148, which he actually wanted to do, he wanted to go back to school. But here's the problem. Walter was convinced that the only way he can get to, uh, to PS 148 is to re-enroll. And his mother had to go with him to do that. And given her declining mental and physical health, getting just to the Upper West Side was no simple task. So what did he do? He did the next best thing. He went back to PS 76 with his younger brother, Doe, whose teacher always allowed him to stay for lessons. Consequently, PS 148 administrators reported Walter as a truant. Okay, so you see where this is going. All of the agencies tasked with protest, protecting children failed Walter Vandermeer. This epic failure was not simply a matter of administrative incompetence or a tragic tale of a child falling through the cracks or of some kind of unwieldy bureaucracy. As legal scholar Dorothy Roberts demonstrates, the elaborate system we call child protective services was designed to discipline, punish, and control poor families, especially black, brown, and indigenous families. By classifying Walter as neglected, the court blamed Lily exclusively for his behavior. Rather than provide much needed resources, the state removes children from families and assigns them to an array of government and private agencies. Walter, like generations of black and brown kids lost to premature death or organized abandonment, was a victim of administrative violence. Even John Schoenbeck, Walter's most empathetic counselor, failed to see the harm caused by family separation and relocation. It took Schoenbeck less than a month to diagnose his client as, quote, severely disturbed and in need of not only basic necessities, but, quote, love, support, and dependability. He got none of these, and it enraged him. And these are from Schoenbeck's notes. His description of Walter as an isolated, lonely, abandoned child contrasted sharply with Schoenbeck's own reports of his frequent unauthorized visits at home. So when he was at um, uh, Floyd Patterson house, he would leave without permission and go back to Harlem to hang out. 
to see his family. These are unauthorized visits. Life in Harlem was hardly ideal, but Walter had friends, family ties, and kin. He went back to connect with the people he loved, his many siblings, his partners, Miss Catherine, Aunt Sarah, Mrs. Carlitha Morrison, his stepfather, and of course his mother, and to get love in return. But in the prof professional view of the social workers, psychologists, teachers, truant officers, and guidance counselors, Walter Vandermeer was neglected and their job was to save him. Now, so for Walter and his family, the fall of 1969 was the start of their winter of discontent. His brother, Reggie Brooks, was using heroin and hustling to survive. In September, he was arrested for armed robbery and three months later convicted and sentenced to three years at Rikers Island. His eldest brother, Eugene Price, had just returned from Vietnam that summer only to be, called, to be called for a second tour duty in November. That same month, month, Lily was evicted from her apartment on 8th Avenue and all of her furniture had been seized by the sanitation department and stored at a cost of $2 a day. She told her caseworker that she uh, withheld the rent in order to force the landlord to repair a broken toilet. But having never filed a formal complaint with the housing court, she had no standing. The family found shelter at a friend's already crowded apartment at 371 West 116th Street. And in the midst of, family, of this family chaos, Walter stopped going to class with Doe and spent his days in the streets and nights sleeping on a fire escape. Living on the street left Walter vulnerable to violence and injury. I mean, keep in mind, he's 11 years old. In the weeks leading up to his 12th birthday, he reportedly was struck in the head with a brick, hit by a car, and fell from a fire escape, sustaining inju injuries for which he received no medical care. As soon as Tony learned about the, the eviction, he got permission to go home for a day, and he found that Lily's drinking had gotten worse, her relationship with some of the neighborhood women had cooled, and their living situation was just simply untenable. Worst of all, Friends told him that his little brother was using drugs. The news left him feeling distraught and helpless. He redoubled his efforts to have him placed at, again at his group home in Yonkers, but he was too late. A few weeks later, he was dead. Now, press accounts of Walter's death prompted the Department of Social Services to investigate Lily's household after months of neglect. The investigation consisted of a single home visit from a social worker on the day of the funeral. So predictably, the report found her to be unfit and recommended placing her children in foster care. Lily fought back to retain a lawyer through uh, Harlem Assertion of Rights Incorporated, who persuaded the judge to let her keep her children on the condition that she find adequate housing. Now, Walter's death had an immediate galvanizing effect on an emerging debate over drug policy, crime, and policing. And what had been a growing concern suddenly morphed into a moral panic. A slew of articles on the alarming number of children dying from drugs and warning of a heroin epidemic flooded the media during the first few months of 1970. And they included grim tales of 10-year-old pushers and four-year-olds rubbing heroin on their gums. Harlem politicians responded with swift indignation and calls for action. And, you know, I have um, a bunch of examples of that, but I'm gonna skip over all of them. Um, but just imagine, he's being debated on the floor of Congress. He's being named, um, Rock, Governor Rockefeller is declaring a total war on juvenile drug abuse. Um, you've got black politicians saying to the Board of Education that this is a case of gross negligence and introducing a bill that would require uh, schools to keep track of students and curtail suspensions and expulsions, which we should do, right? Um, Walter Vandermeer became the poster child of the war on drugs, but it did not begin in December 1969. It had been escalating for several years, although heroin flooded Black communities in the 1950s. It only became a national concern once it spread to white neighborhoods and college campuses. The supply also grew exponentially as the Vietnam War stimulated the Asian poppy market and turned American GIs into addicts, uh, demand for all manner of illicit drugs rose during the 60s 
and the police protected the drug trade as long, long as they got a cut. Now, the increase in quantity and the in consumption of heroin corresponded with a move to decriminalize addiction as opposed to sale and distribution. And there's a long, elaborate history of, of, of this earlier war on drugs. Um, I can't talk about it here, but there's two things I just want to point out. One, in 1962, the Supreme Court ruled that addicts cannot be jailed for being addicts, but they can be confined for compulsory treatment. In institutionalization, which is carceral. So they permitted a carceral rehabilitation system. So it's no surprise that these state-run treatment centers not only resemble prisons, but they actually were built, created in prisons. Um, the second thing is that compulsory treatment coincided with the introduction of methadone, which is a synthetic opiate administered as a substitute for heroin. The only difference between uh, heroin and methadone is that methadone was legal, government controlled, free to registered addicts and produce very little euphoria. Who did it benefit? It benefited pharmaceutical companies and politicians who sold the idea that methadone reduced crime since addicts no longer had to hustle to get a fix. Um, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff, but let me just say the, the last two things I wanna talk about um, with time I have left, is I wanna to turn to a few examples of black organizing in response to Walter's death. A group of black women, let's see, got an image here. Yeah, I'll keep that up there. A group of black women led by uh, Maxine Waldron, Jeanette Harris, Angela Ferguson, and several other Harlem activists organized Mothers Against Drugs um, to confront the pushers and drive them out of the community. But protecting children would remain their primary focus. Walter's death inspired Matt to demand uh, hospital based facilities that admitted addicts under 18. There were none in the city at the time, and methadone treatment was, was limited to adults. So on January 13, 1970, MAD and the Academy for uh, Black and Latin Education, ABLE, occupied the offices of St. Luke's Hospital's uh, Community Psychiatry Division uh, on Morningside Drive. And by the way, that the building where that uh, the St. Luke's uh, Psychiatry Division was, was a building I lived in, the 44 Morningside Drive when I was at Columbia, uh, which is a really nice building, by the way. I had a great apartment um, with a beautiful view. But I didn't know that. That's like spooky. Um, anyway, they refused to leave unless the administration agreed to three demands. Admit minors to his detox program, set aside 40, to, 40 of its 715 beds for detoxification, and commit to working with Harlem community groups to tackle addiction. After four days of protests, in negotiations, most of the demands were met. Um, and this is actually a picture from the sit-in um, there. And St. Luke's agreed to dedicate the new adolescent unit in memory of Walter Vandermeer. Um, two months later, after the St. Luke's campaign, MAD organized an even larger action against Roosevelt Hospital in Midtown Manhattan um, and against NYPD's complicity in drug trafficking. trafficking. Uh, dozens of, of of mothers and a lot of supporters from high school students mainly marched down 125th Street to 59th in Columbus Circle, tying up traffic, carrying placards that read police and pushers work hand in hand, mad is mad at police, et cetera. Um, they, they made some demands, of course, but the administrators of, of uh, Roosevelt did not even, weren't even willing to negotiate. Uh, there were several community-based organizations that focused on treatment, um, I'm going to skip over this. The Black Panther Party uh, certainly developed a reputation for fighting drug dealers. And in fact, the New York Panthers would raid drug dens, threaten addicts with guns drawn, um, and, and dealers if they didn't vacate the premises. But the strategy was not effective since the pushers always return with police protection. Unable to eliminate the supply, they decided to focus on the demand that is ending addiction and turning um, drug victims into revolutionaries. So by the end of 1970, they would establish the first people's drug program in New York City. Okay. So the catalyst for this was Baco Siddawile Tabor's um, widely, read widely read pamphlet, Capitalism Plus Dope Equals Genocide, came out in 1970. 
Tabor wrote the essay while waiting trial on conspiracy charges as part of the Panther 21. A Harlem native, Tabor was a brilliant student and a promising athlete derailed by heroin addiction at uh, the age of 13. He managed to break his habit after seven years and he joined the Black Panther Party. The opening sentence of capitalism plus dope equals genocide references Walter Vandermeer, though not by name, underscoring once again the catalytic impact of his death. And he writes, recently in the Black colony of Harlem, a 12-year-old Black boy was murdered by an overdose of heroin. That is to say, Walter died by homicide, murdered by the settler colonial state, racism and capitalism. The pamphlet's argument um, is stated unambiguously in the title. Capitalism accumulates wealth by exploitation, produces unlivable conditions that lead to premature death, and drugs are not only an inherent part of the system, but a kind of death-dealing accelerant. All the treatment protocols in the world will not end the plague, he argues, because, quote, these programs deliberately negate or at best deal flippantly with the socioeconomic origins of drug addiction. Now, the Panthers, MAD, ABLE, groups like the community thing, most activists and Harlem residents all agreed that the police were not the solution. They were the problem. To those community members who scream more police protection, Tabor asked readers to remember that the police are alien hostile troops sent into the black colonies by the ruling class, not to protect the lives of black people, but rather to protect the economic interests and private property of the capitalists and make certain that black people don't get out of place. Um, he was actually referring to people like Reverend Oberia uh, Dempsey, who was a pastor of Upper Park uh, Avenue Baptist Church and director of Harlem's anti-crime and anti-narcotic committee. And, and what he was doing was he was engaging some vigilante activities against drug dealers, but his, his point was to work with the police. He felt like he needed more police. And we could talk about that. Uh, Walter's death had a profound impact on the Black arts movement. Um, there was a play by Al Fan called King Heroin. Um, I'm gonna skip over this because uh, I'm, I'm looking at the time and I wanna, it's an it's a interesting play and I have interesting things to say about it, but I'm gonna skip it. <laughs> um, in any case, you know, the play itself, without going into it, you know, promised no easy solutions, uh, but it did send, there's two things about the play I want to say. First, um, you know, it was a community-based thing. It was performed in churches, community organizations, because he had very little money, but eventually got to Washington, D.C. Um, when Charlie Rangel convinced the Nixon administration to have, uh, have it performed uh, in D.C. at the National Institute of Mental Health for a one-night performance. And what's clear about it is no matter what impact it had on policy, Rangel and Nixon's aide found the play attractive because they understood it as a cautionary, cautionary tale that vindicates the police. Because the star of the play is Lieutenant Hendricks, played by Al Fan, who's the good guy. Uh, the elevation of the Black cop as a potential savior and the absence of a radical community-based alternative mute the play's critique of government indifference in a socioeconomic system that compels some Black people to prey on others. Um, but the play itself did not celebrate policing. It just had a police officer as a central character. Now, of course, this was the message of capitalism plus dope equals genocide um, and the message of the Black Panther Party, the message that led to the founding of the first people's uh, drug program known as Lincoln Detox Center. And some of you may know the story. The seeds were planted in 1969 when hospital workers at Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx formed the health uh, revolutionary unity movement um, with support of the Black Panthers. And of course, the Young Lords uh, participated and they actually began organizing there and famously took over the hospital, implementing several programs like screenings for anemia, lead poisoning, iron deficiency, and tuberculosis. But the, the, the sort of the, the jewel in the crown was the Lincoln Detox Center, uh, which was uh, led by Zaid uh, Malik Shakur of the Harlem chapter of the Black Panther Party, as well as uh, Cleo Silvers and Vicente Panama Alba of the Young Lords. Um, 
the main person who uh, who ran it was Mutulu Shakur, who was recently released, is in California now. Um, and he was brought in to teach political education classes. He was just 20 years old, 21 years old at the time, a veteran black nationalist. He developed a curriculum for, for patients and hospital workers that unpacked the relationship between racism, capitalism, the drug trade, and American imperialism, and examined the links between organized crime the pharma pharmaceutical industry and the role that drugs played as a form of state-sponsored chemical warfare. Um, two years into the program, uh, into the program, Mutulu introduced acupuncture, acupressure, and reflexology to cure withdrawal symptoms. And this is very important. His comrade in the Black Liberation Movement, Japanese American radical Yuri Kochiyama, basically hipped him to acupuncture, which he then formally studied and trained other staff members in Chinese techniques of acupuncture. And in the course of five years, they managed to detox some 35,000 addicts. But Mutulu understood that acupuncture was not the real cure. The Lincoln People's Program explained, quote, since the drug plague is the result of the diabolical, avaricious, racist, sexist, and classist nature of the society, acupuncture is no solution. In that it will allow for drugless detox, we believe, it will help people better deal with the root cause of addiction, as people's medicine is the big step toward reclaiming control over our own bodies and minds. Now, many of the people who reclaim their bodies and minds joined the Black Panthers and Young Lords and the um, Republican New Africa and the Nation of Islam and others, and some joined the welfare rights organizations and whatnot. Um, they went from being treated as a menace to society to becoming a danger to the state. The program fell in the crosshairs of the FBI, and one of its lead physicians, Dr. Richard Taft, survived one assassination attempt in 1974, only to be found dead in a hospital closet three months later. The following year, hospital administrators tried to shut down the program, but an effective staff protest delayed the inevitable. On November 28, 1978, with the blessings of hospital administrators, Mayor Ed Koch authorized a massive police raid on the clinic, bringing an end to the city's most uh, unique and arguably most successful heroin pro detox program. Okay, so let me conclude here. Um, what I do talk about is the um, Rockefeller drug laws and the way, in, in a nutshell, the Nixon administration had shifted withdrawn a lot of his support for rehabilitation and shifted that move, um, uh, money to, uh, uh, to law enforcement. And the Rockefeller drug laws basically did the same, except it was much more draconian and led, kind of led the way. Um, and I won't talk about the, the laws themselves, but just let me just say something by way of conclusion, um, the, if, the impact that they had. Of course, the Rockefeller drug laws failed to deliver on his promise of safety and security. And in New York City, property crime actually rose between 1973 and 1975, and heroin use remained the same. A devastating fiscal crisis in 1975, exacerbated by a global recession, not only led to cuts in social services, public employment, including NYPD, education, welfare, transportation, but further gutted funding for drug treatment programs. In 1976, the city closed down its addiction services agency, and um, the following year ceded responsibility for overseeing drug treatment uh, to the state. By the time crack cocaine hit the streets, funding cuts severely undermined New York's uh, treatment capacity. The terms of restructuring the debt imposed by the city's financial institutions like Citibank and the bondholders not only deepened inequality, but resulted in permanent layoffs, declining wages, higher uh, rates of unemployment, and homelessness, skyrocketing real estate values and rents, cuts in welfare alongside massive tax incentives to attract financial sector growth. The Rockefeller drug laws did not immediately impact incarceration rates. In fact, uh, New York prison's population declined sharply between 73 and 1980. Then everything changed in the mid 1980s. And notice I'm talking about these democratic mayors here. Municipal state budgets started to grow again, which allowed Mayor Ed Koch to expand the NYPD by 19%. The turn to street level drug arrest turn, uh, during the crack uh, cocaine era and an increase in quality of life and broken windows policing produced a wave of new prisoners. 
The proportion of New York state prisoners incarcerated for drug crimes rose from 9% in 1980 to 25% in 1988. And by 1997, nearly half of the state's prisoners had been incarcerated for drug offenses. So Walter Vandermeer wasn't in the grave two years when the state declared a new uh, war on drug or escalated a war on drugs in his name. This war has filled our jails and prisons, grown our police, turned some neighborhoods into open air prisons, stripped vulnerable residents of equal protection, habeas corpus, freedom of movement, even protection from torture. This war has rendered every working class black and brown person without a uniform an enemy combatant. Their bodies carrying the mark of suspicion from birth and by circumstances. This war expanded the use of stop and frisk and no knock warrants, like the ones used to invade uh, the home of Breonna Taylor and take her life in a hail of bullets. This war has many casualties like Lamarley Graham, targeted for buying a bag of weed from an undercover cop in the Bronx and fatally shot, like Khalif Browder, a 16 year old Bronx kid arrested on false allegations of stealing a backpack. He spent three years at Rikers Island because he refused to cop a plea deal, could not afford bail, and had to wait for an overtaxed criminal justice system to find him a court date. Rikers broke Khalif uh, physically and mentally. He was innocent and the state knew it. Lacking physical forensic evidence and no eyewitnesses, he was finally released on June 5th, 2013. Two years later, as we all know, Khalif Browder hanged himself. Khalif and Walter were both casualties of state violence, even if the agents of the state did not do the work of ending their lives. Nearly a half a century separated them, and yet they had so much in common. Walter's problem was not addiction, it was poverty, bureaucratic indifference, organized abandonment, and the consequences of living in an over-policed and under-resourced community. He lived in a world where the state took black children from their families rather than give black families what they need to care for their children and keep their community safe. In Walter's case, the forms of detention and separation he endured were supposed to save him uh, from the streets and implicitly from his mother. A couple of years after burying his brother, Tony Vandermeer took summer courses at Marist College through the Upward Bound program, um, which is a college prep program for underrepresented youth. And there he met a young black man named Gerald Hooks, who brought students from the college to Green Haven Correctional Facility in Stormville, New York. Uh, Hooks, a self-identified former heroin addict, had been incarcerated at Green Haven. He was the first student from Green Haven to attend Marist College. The visits and conversations with Hooks radicalized Tony. He moved to Boston to study at Northeastern University and was drawn to radical politics. He joined the National Black Student Association, the African People's Party, and befriended several leading activists, including Yuri Kochiyama, who had encouraged Mutulu Shakur to study acupuncture. acupuncture. He has had a long distinguished career as a fighter for social justice and a professor of Africana studies at University of Massachusetts, Boston. Political struggle was essential to his survival. He says, that's how I endured losing Walter. It was a lonely process, but he was always there, a reminder of what we need to do. I believe we had to organize because the state was behind Walter's death and the death of many others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not okay. Is this working? Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. So um, as Professor Kelly alluded to, um, we had some tech issues that gave us a late start. We had some multiple introductions. Right. So we're a little bit behind, um, but we do have time for a couple of questions. If people have them, just put your hand up. Um, for accessibility purposes, please do not speak without a microphone. Um, I will come to you with a mic um, and please keep your questions yeah. as brief as you can. I spoke for 51 minutes. So that's it. <laughs> so don't be mad at me. <laughs> I was trying to rush to it. I skip over a lot of stuff. So yeah, questions. I'll take any questions. I mean, we have as much time as you, as you got. I'm not in a hurry. Okay, thanks. How do you take care of yourself mentally when you're doing this work? You know, I, I have a lot of calluses. I have to say, I was talking to graduate students today. Um, you know, I, I took on this project. I added, well, I was going to write a book about Walter. Vandermeer. And my uh, agent, like, and my publisher was like, this can't be a book. It could have been a book, but I didn't do it. But the thing is, 
I grew up with the story. I mean, this is a personal story, a family story, something I remembered and I carried with it. So if you see this all the time, it's not that uh, you become uh, numb, it's that you build calluses. Because this kind of violence uh, is everywhere all the time. And that's what our ancestors did. You know, part of the reason why, you know, because this is a, the chapter itself is like 70 pages, and I try to get it down to this. But part of the reason for tracing the family history is to show that every generation dealt with family death, administrative violence, state violence, extra legal violence on every year of their lives. And so that by the time Lily gets to New York, she's inherited all this, you know? And it's, it's important to, to go into the choices that she made, which I'm not judging. Like, I'm not judging the fact that she had all these kids and all these relationships. That's her prerogative. The tragedy is not her choices. She tried to be the best mother she could be, you know? Um, the tragedy is that she lived in a world where the resources available to her to make choices were not available to her. And that was the real issue. So for me, I do get emotional thinking about um, Walter and about what was lost at the time. Um, but I keep moving because our ancestors kept moving, you know? And our children are gonna keep moving through this. And I, I added that postscript for a reason because Tony Vandermeer kept moving. And he kept moving because of his brother's death. And that's the thing that's amazing to me. You know, he becomes a professor of Africana studies, you know, and, and, and a radical. He's, he's back and forth to Cuba all the time. So that's, that's what keeps me going. And, and what kept him going and what keeps me going, what keeps a lot of people going, is that we don't suffer in isolation. We suffer in struggle, in community, in movement. And it's those folks who don't have connections to movements that I think are dealing with pain without a community to help them. And one last thing I'll say about this, you know, part of the reason why I try to keep coming back to the theme of kin in the networks, the social networks that, that did their best to protect Lily and protect every generation before that um, is because that's how people move together in community. Um, social services, child protective services are against that. They're about destroying community because they think, you know, the idea is they think they know better. And that's why Dorothy Roberts has been, she's been fighting this fight for a long time and just being attacked from the, the social workers over this. And she is right about that. That's a long answer, but I hope that answers the question. You know, someone else? Oh, Brenda. Wow. I didn't know you were here. Yeah. I'll ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one of the greatest historians on the planet. You know, uh, thanks for this. And uh, in uh, reading your work and Simon's and the work of people like uh, Heather Thompson, mm -hmm. one of the things that, that comes out, there seems to be a kind of a, a cyclical quality to this war on drugs business. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, we're in one now. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, some progressive ha have lost elections this year, you know, based on, you know, the rever you know, reversion to right. fear of, of crime. So is anything to be said about what, what, what is, you know, it, uh, does the cycle have a meaning? The back and forth itself have a meaning? Right, right. Um, I think so. In fact, the thing that I skipped over here was... Um, was the the sort of what preceded Walter's death, and that is the battle between uh, New York State and and New York City. Uh, John Lindsay was a Republican uh, who was much more progressive on these matters, and so you have Lindsay's policies. Um, again, this is all this is all really the mid '60s. Now and we can go back into the '30s and see the cycle, uh, but in the mid '60s, you've got Lindsay who is saying, um, I want 
you know, I, I want to focus on treatment, not on punishment, not on locking people up. You got Rockefellers like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to basically try to be president. So I'm going to focus on punishment. Um, and so they battled each other. And Lindsay's policies were defeated and they were defeated by capital. So again, this goes back to the question of, of cycle. Um, Lindsay hired um, uh, as his so-called drug czar, um, Dr. Efren Ramirez, who's Puerto Rican, who was like, I'm against methadone. I'm for encounter methods of, this, um, of really trying to figure out how people could sort of um, help each other through encounter. Uh, and what happened, the city council basically forced Lindsay to fire. I mean, he, he didn't fire, he was forced to resign after two years. Why? Because all these people in the city council basically were getting money from the methadone companies to support methadone, right? So here's where, again, we see a cycle of policy, but behind the cycle are these other things that are happening, like methadone as um, a, a treatment that is really meant to support pharmaceutical companies. Um, Susanna Rice, who's a former student of mine from NYU, wrote an amazing book about uh, US foreign policy and drug policy. And again, you could see the same thing where um, even what is considered licit or illicit shifts, you know, so that cocaine at one point is legal. And when it becomes illegal, then there, then you see wars by the state against it, you know. Um, it wasn't always there. And so Oh, you know, eventually, Lindsay's policies around the police are defeated by the police. Because remember, he ran for mayor on, he wasn't arguing for more policing. He was arguing for police reform. He says I, he ran and was elected because he promised to, um, to make a, create a more robust civilian, uh, um, uh, uh, civilian complaint review board. And what did the Patrolman's Benevolent Association do? They got a referendum passed to eliminate the Civilian Complaint Review Board. And they did it by putting out all the scare tactics. Like they had a mass media campaign warning that, you know, if we have a civilian review process, it means that we'll have more riots and rapists. And they won. And they won because they got the votes from, from Queens, they got the votes from Staten Island, and they got the votes from some black middle class people who are like, you know, we're, we want more police. So, in terms of the way policing of drugs takes place, once you get beyond the actual drug itself, be in the damage it might do or not do, and get to um, what is the relationship between policing, local, state, federal government policies. And most importantly, um, who makes the money? Then you begin to see a war on drugs that repeats itself and repeats itself because A, a heightened war wins votes in certain circumstances because you can use a crime fear. B, um, the um, a heightened war is a way to create a more robust police the part because police are, pol are political actors themselves. Um, and then uh, see the war on drugs, just like the war on drugs in the 50s and the war on drugs in the 60s and 70s was always a war on poor people. And that's the cycle. So even though the war that I'm talking about really doesn't take off to the 60s, even the flood of heroin in the 50s becomes um, justification for certain raids and police uh, participation, unless of course the police then are getting paid. So I, I, think, um, I think sometimes the war on drug, um, uh, the war on drug sometimes is a kind of smoke screen for other kinds of things that are happening. And so the whole point of this, of this chapter is to say, you know, before the war on drugs that we know, you know, whether it's Nixon, whether it's Reagan, whatever, that there were other kinds of wars taking place in the name of the war on drugs uh, that ultimately led to premature death and not, be, not simply because of the drugs. You know, 
Um, and you know, this case for decriminalization, all kind, you know, if, if you actually push for decriminalization, what are you gonna get? You'll get um, a lack of incentive for the war. And then the cycle in some ways breaks, but it won't break entirely because the one thing that won't change is capitalism. And we got proof of that. I proof of it in LA, I could prove it, marijuana. Got all these black people and brown people went to jail for marijuana. Some are still there. And now, um, because of legalization, especially in LA, you got big corporate money behind selling marijuana. And those same black families are as poor as they were before, you know? So even when you do decriminalize, decriminalization uh, in tandem with um, commodification still does the same damage. And that is the point that Michael Tabor and Matulu and all of them have been saying all, all over again. Look, you know, you, we need to basically end capitalism. And I, I believe that. I said it, yes, you know. Anyway. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll be shorter with my answer. Take a um, anyone want to take a crack at, at one final question? It's the last chance before I go to jail. <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe I maybe I don't oh, step yeah, on the point. Yeah. I promise I won't. I, I I give long answers because um, things are always complicated. Thank you, Simon, for bringing an amazing historian. Um, so excited! Thank you, Professor Kelly. Um, so I actually I have a question, but also a comment. Right. So on our ballot on April fourth, there are some important referendums related to the carceral state mm -hmm. um, that we really need to vote against if you're in line with what um, Dr. Kelly has demonstrated here. Um, but also I wanted to share, so I teach at, um, I used to teach yoga at Dane County Jail and I would have women there say that yoga felt better than heroin. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciated you bringing in the acupuncture and um, cool to hear Yuri Kochiyama's connection to that. Um, but as you said, right, like that's not the, that doesn't get to the root causes, right, of the problem. Right. So I, I teach courses at UW Green Bay, but I also teach courses at Green Bay Correctional Institution, which is a max security institution two hours to the north of here. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I say this to, to state that everything that you're saying, right, is sort of spot on when you're tracing this history and like the, the history of black motherhood and kinship and these types of things. Right. And the guys that I'm teaching there right now aren't necessarily there for drug addiction, but they're right. there for realities often very much connected to this war that you're talking right. about. And so, like, I'm really interested in thinking about, too, um, like the metaphor that you used for the death of um, of Walter being connected to the long history of right. anti-black racial terror and and lynching um, because the guys that are there right now are all, they're very much, right, they're all taken basically from the same zip code or the same two zip codes in Milwaukee, which we know is one of the most segregated cities mm -hmm. in the country. And so I'm really interested um, in what you think about, like, is this more of a Northern phenomenon? Do we see these same types of replications? in Southern states or how would they look different or have they looked different um, in Northern and in Southern places? Right. Well, you know, that's a good question. And I guess one of the things I've always resisted was the sectionalism only because even in the 19th century, uh, Du Bois kept showing us, you know, that, um, and in fact, Tulani shows us in her amazing book, you know, The Man's Patient Circuit, that you know what's happening in the South um, is not only really the um, not just the center of oppression, but the center of possibility uh, in relationship to what's happening elsewhere in the United States. But let, let's just to focus on your question. Um, I should explain the book. So the the book is I'm, I'm about to change the title, um, but it was called Black Body Swinging, and what I do is each chapter begins with a death. But most of the deaths I look at are, um, with the exception of a chapter that deals with gendered violence and what people might think of as 
um, serial murders of black women. Um, most of the other ones are police killings. So I have a chapter that opens up with Rakia Boyd that looks at Chicago. Um, and again, I use family histories as a way to understand what really kills people. That it's not simply um, a police officer's bullet or baton or a, a taser or whatever. It's it's you know it's, it goes much deeper. It's tied to things like real estate, stadiums, you know, municipal debt. Um, so Rakia Boyd's the, the chapter on her um, her family in Chicago is also uh, a look at the way in which. Um, the outlay of billions of dollars in what's called police brutality bonds to pay for wrongful death and police violence is actually one of the sources of debt in the city of Chicago, which, of course, bondholders and banks like, you know, Chase Manhattan and others are able to benefit from through processing these, these, um, these outlays rather than actually you know, eliminate a system of brutality, right? So I got Rakia Boyd, I got a chapter on Timothy Thomas in Cincinnati, same thing, a chapter, um, uh, uh, of course, Michael Brown looking at St. Louis, uh, you know, um, I got, and so Walter Vandenberg fits in that. Uh, Brianna Taylor, which is also a study of, of the long history of police violence, not just in Louisville, and by the way, some of the victims of police violence in the history of Louisville police are poor white people, which I also deal with, leading up to the way Louisville becomes both a police state, but also a, a very strong labor state in which the suppression of labor is part of the development of the police state. Um, Louisville is also a place, just like Cincinnati, where there's a strong LGBTQ struggle in the 1970s and 80s that's also rewoven into the story of policing. Um, and, you know, and there are others, but, but one very important story. So C Cincinnati is, is the South, let's be honest. So you've got Cincinnati as a Southern city. Um, you've got Louisville as a Southern city. But I also have a chapter on Jonathan Sanders in Mississippi. Now, Jonathan Sanders is killed, not in a big city, but in a very small um, town outside of Meridian. And he is killed by police as he's riding a horse and buggy. This is 2015. It's not long ago. Um, and in Mississippi, in a state where the Republic of New Africa had basically made a commitment to take Mississippi back in 1968, and they took the capital, they took Jackson. And Jackson, of course, is the, the state of Mississippi is waging war on Jackson as a, it's not just a black city, but it's a potentially black radical city. And that's why they're waging war on Jackson. We've had black cities before, but not like that. And so it so happens that Chokwe, Antoine Lumumba took the case for Jonathan Sanders and they were fighting on his behalf. Um, Benjamin Crump passed. <laughs> ah! Yeah, I said it. He passed on the case because there was no money there. I'm just saying, I'm just speaking the truth. But the Jonathan Sanders story is an incredible story because again, this is the South, but what is the South anyway? The South is a place that's also a center of industry. The Burlington uh, Mill was there when it shut down, Jonathan Sanders' mother was working there. She was a foreman, she lost her job. Um, and, you know, so it's a, and there's a question about disability with the mother. There's a lot of things that are going on, but what's, really interesting about, um, about the Sanders story is that in this small town, I was going over the arrest records for drug uh, sale possession. And the police arrested, had more arrests than there were black people in the town. So in other words, everyone's being arrested on drug possession and sale, even if they didn't have drugs. So we don't think of uh, policing and drugs as a kind of Southern rural problem or even a Southern urban problem. And yet the same system is operating, right? So ultimately, um, every single story I talk about 
and there, there are more, is a, is a kind of examination of how racial capitalism kills people. And it kills Black people for sure. That's the center of it. But it kills all these other people who are on the outskirts, including poor white people, you know? Um, which is why their investment in, um, in a system that they think they're going to benefit from makes no sense, right? And we come back to, uh, to all these radical organizations that, whether we're talking about um, Fred Hampton in the Rainbow Coalition, Black Panther Party in Chicago, or we're talking about Matulu Shakur in New York, or we're talking about, you know, um, uh, movements like uh, uh, Margaret Prescott, in her struggles against uh, uh, serial killings of Black women in Los Angeles. Or, you know, they're all making the case that in order to really liberate us as human beings, we've got to recognize the way in which this racial capitalist system of violence and extraction actually affects the, all of us differentially, but affects all of us. And that's the point that they've all been making, you know, no matter what anyone says about identity politics. And I talk about Barbara Smith in the in the piece. So I talk about Boston as well. Anyway, that that's a long answer to the question, but that's what the book's about. And um, and if you want me to finish, don't write me an email. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, thank you to Robin for being so generous with his time. And. Um, We'll see you next year for the third annual Doria D. Johnson Lecture in History and Social Justice.